So now that Japan is under a relative sense of isolation since the missions to China were terminated, we see that, as I mentioned previously, Japan really starts to focus in on itself and really hone and domesticate its own culture, its own native culture. And so during the Heian period, you see that Japan really becomes a highly aristocratic society. What we mean by aristocratic society is that society and culture is really determined and dictated by the imperial court, by the emperor, and also by the aristocrats, the aristocratic families that served under him. Okay, and if you might remember, go back to the Asuka period and Minata period, where you had a lot of Uji clans, right, influential clans who would help the emperor with political matters. These same Uji clans have now amassed a lot of wealth, a lot of influence, and they become aristocratic families. And beginning in the 850s, one particular family, which you might remember from the Asuka period, remember the Fujiwara family? They were an Uji clan that was opposed to the Soga clan, and they got rid of them, and they started to become the emperor's right-hand man and men, and they became the uh, ministers in court. This particular family becomes extremely influential at court. By this time, it's been 200 years since they've been on the national scene, and they've gotten a lot of money and a lot of influence. So the emperors would appoint the Fujiwara into very, very high positions. Whenever there was a position open for a governor of a distant province, or they needed a minister or a bureaucrat, the emperor really took a liking to the Fujiwara family and put them into these very high positions. So as a result, the Fujiwara family becomes very wealthy and very influential. But remember, despite the Fujiwara family's immense power, immense influence, they never tried to depose the emperor. Why not? Remember, even now, the emperor is still considered to be a divine god. The emperor himself is a kami. He is, he's a divine being. He's a god. And so the Fujiwara family, or any family for that matter, could never even dream of deposing a kami. That would never happen. So even though the Fujiwara family held immense power behind the scenes, they never tried to get rid of the emperor. Okay, But don't get me wrong. Throughout the 800s, the 900s, and into the in 1000s, for three centuries, the Fujiwara holds an immense, extreme amount of power and influence over the emperor. Okay, And they control, really, they're the power behind the scenes. They're the puppeteer behind the emperor. So what you start to see is a pattern that uh, happens a lot in Japanese history, in, in that the emperor is almost like a religious figure. He's a divine god. He's the ultimate ruler. He's an absolute monarch. But he's not really getting too deeply involved in politics. He is used by other people to be the representative of the people who really hold power behind the scenes. And those people who hold power behind the scenes change depending on the era of Japanese history. In the Heian period, the people who hold power behind the scenes are the Fujiwara family. And they will never try to get rid of the emperor, but at the same time, they're the ones who are basically telling him what to do. And starting in the year 858, the Fujiwara family says, we're going to declare ourselves imperial regents. In Japanese, the title is Kampaku. Okay? And keep in mind that there were many, many clans at court who had various levels of influence over the emperor. The Fujiwara want to make sure they are the top honcho. They want to be the leader and they want to be at the head of the pack. And so by becoming imperial regents, by becoming Kampaku, they essentially become the emperor's main chief advisor. If anything is decided, it's going to have to be approved by the Fujiwara regent. Okay, And so they become the power behind the throne, and that's why many historians refer to the Fujiwara clan not as the Fujiwara clan, but rather as the Fujiwara regents. Okay, And what the Fujiwara family did that was very smart was they made this title of imperial regent hereditary, which means that it would pass from father to son. So you would have an imperial regent, he would die, and then his son would become the new regent. So it was a hereditary title, which basically ensured that this position, this powerful, influential position, would always be in the hands of the Fujiwara family. And how do you think the Fujiwara were able to attain such power and influence and make sure it stayed in their grasp? Because remember, you could have an emperor who would, you know, a new emperor might ascend the throne and say, I don't want these people having so much power. Who are the Fujiwara family? Well, they came up with a very, very genius system called the marriage system, okay, or the marital system, which ensured that the Fujiwara family would have a mastery or control of the imperial family. And this is through marital or marriage alliances with the imperial family. This is a very, very interesting um, phenomenon that takes place throughout Japanese history, and the Fujiwara family are really the ones who came up with it. So, how did it work?
<clears throat> well, you would have an emperor, and then you would have a Fujiwara regent, right? The emperor is going to get married. He needs to find a suitable bride. Well, the Fujiwara regent would say, Your Majesty, why don't you marry my daughter? Okay, the, Fu the princess, the Fujiwara family princess. So, the emperor would marry a daughter of the Fujiwara regent. Okay, they would, she would become the empress, they would have a child, and this is the crown prince, the heir to the throne. He will eventually be the emperor. So, remember, this emperor, this, this crown prince, the child, the newborn, his father is going to be the emperor of imperial blood, of the imperial family. The mother is going to be from what family? The Fujiwara family, right? And who is going to be the baby's maternal grandfather? The mom's dad. Well, it's going to be the Fujiwara regent, right? So what happens to this crown prince who's going to become the emperor one day? Well, he's going to be half imperial family blood, half Fujiwara family blood, right? And so essentially the imperial family and the Fujiwara family become intertwined, right? So they're going to be connected forever <clears throat> through both marital and family ties, right? And I like this, uh, this, this slide because it says Fujiwara control of the emperors. And that's really what it was. For, for two centuries, you really always had an emperor marrying a daughter, a princess of the Fujiwara family. So you would have the crown prince having one, you know, on one side of his family, his dad's side, he's going to be related to the imperial family. But on his mom's side, he's going to have Fujiwara blood. So really, it was a way for the Fujiwara family to almost keep the imperial family hostage by ensuring that, well, we're related, so you got to listen to us. So thus, during the Heian period, without exception, all the emperors had Fujiwara mothers. Okay, so you would have an emperor, he would marry a Fujiwara princess, his son would eventually marry a Fujiwara princess, right? And then his son would marry a Fujiwara princess, so it would continue from generation to generation. And this is why you had a lot of inbreeding in the imperial family that would lead to many emperors having both physical and mental illnesses. And the most recent case of this was the Emperor Taisho, who reigned in the 1920s. We'll learn about him at the end of the course, but he is the most recent example of an emperor who was ill, due to possibly the large amount of inbreeding that took place in the imperial family over the centuries. Okay, So the marital system was one way that the Fujiwara family had such control over the court. Another um, reason was this hereditary title of imperial regent. Okay, it was all It had to be passed down from father to son within the Fujiwara family. Okay, so no other family could hold this title. It was a hereditary um, title that was only utilized by the Fujiwara family. So this is important, guys. These two reasons, the marital system and the t fact that the imperial regent title was hereditary, guarantees the Fujiwara family complete control over the court for 200 years, from 858 to 1086. And you'll see what happens in 1086. Someone is going to ascend the throne who's going to come up with another system that's going to put the Fujiwara family in check. But for the majority of the Ham period, the Fujiwara family and the aristocrats who reported to them dominated the uh, this Ham period, Japanese culture, really. Doesn't mean the emperors are going away, right? They're still a divine being. No one is taking that away from them. But there's a power behind the throne dictating what really happens, the Fujiwara. But it doesn't mean that everybody was going to be okay with it and they're going to be fine with the Fujiwara regents. A lot of other Uji clans who are now aristocrats were not very happy with the new influence of the Fujiwara family. One of them was uh, the head of the Sugawara clan, the Sugawara aristocratic family, Mr. Sugawara no Michizane. Okay, and he could not stand the Fujiwara regent, whose name was Fujiwara no Tokihira, the regent at the time. They had a very fierce Rivalry. Okay, Sugawara was brilliant. He was very smart. He was very good at politics. Okay, and the emperor liked him. Fujiwara felt threatened because he didn't want another family getting in the way of, you know, his clan's domination. So one day, the Fujiwara regent, Tokihira, spreads a lie to the emperor and says, you know, Sugawara, I heard Sugawara is planning a coup d'etat and they're planning to get rid of the government. Okay, the emperor likes Sugawara, but at the same time, Fujiwara, the Fujiwara regent is his wife's father. It's his father-in-law. Okay. So, of course, he's going to listen to family before anyone else, right? So, the emperor believes Fujiwara. And so, Sugawara is arrested. He's exiled all the way to Kyushu, which is the southernmost island of Japan. It's very far away. 
So he's exiled all the way to Kyushu, specifically to the city of Dazaifu, where he's exiled. And once he reaches there, Sugawara, of course, has to leave everything in Kyoto behind, including his beloved plum blossom tree, which you can see in the picture. Okay. And uh, there's a poem that uh, Sugawara wrote. He was also a very skilled poet. If the eastern wind blows, bring forth your beautiful fragrance, my dear plum blossoms. Even if your master is not with you, please do not forget the spring. So, you know, this is his beloved plum blossoms that, uh, you know, he left behind in Kyoto. And uh, legend has it that after Sugawara's death, these plum blossoms uprooted themselves from Sugawara's former residence in Kyoto and came all the way to Kyushu, where they are now housed at his former residence, which is currently a Shinto shrine that um, is where Sugawara was, that is where Sugawara is enshrined now. So it's kind of a memorial shrine to Sugawara. So I don't think the plum blossoms really uprooted themselves by themselves and flew over to Dazaifu, but you can still visit that legendary tree today, and apparently it flew itself over from Kyoto. We will never know, okay? And eventually, uh, after Sugawara's death in 903, he died in Dazaifu. He never went back to his beloved Kyoto. His reputation was cleared. It was discovered that, you know, nothing bad had happened. But, you know, at that point he was dead. It was too late. So uh, the emperor actually gave him the title of being a kami, the god of education in Shinto. So it's a very, you know, he was basically raised to divine status. And even today, if you're a high school student in Japan, you're getting ready to take the entrance examinations. If you go to Sugawara Shrine in Dazaifu and you purchase an amulet, which you can see here, this amulet is very lucky and it's guaranteed to get you into the university of your choice and give you a good score on your entrance exam. So he's the god of education, so many students pray to him and help, hoping that he will help them go to the university of their choice.